Ukraine has struck the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol in the second strike against the Russian Navy in as many weeks. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defense editor for The Sun newspaper, and I'm joining you today from Ukraine. I'm standing in the ruins of the Rykarts Hotel in Zaporizhia. We've come here to report on the latest in the war. You may, may remember this hotel was hit by a volley of Russian missiles. We'll start with the strike on the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol. It appears that a storm shadow missile, at least one, possibly more, has struck the headquarters building on land this morning. An unknown, unknown number of casualties uh, at the scene, reports from local officials that a number of ambulances racing to the scene. It's significant because it's the second time Ukraine has managed to strike this naval headquarters, a strategic base for Russia on the occupied Crimean Peninsula in as many weeks. You'll remember uh, they managed to hit a Rapucha class landing ship, the Minsk as well as a Kilo-class submarine, the rostov on -Don, that were both side by side in dry docks for repairs. Now, that was significant because it demonstrated Ukraine had found a way to bypass Russia's air defences. Russia, for all the flaws its military has displayed in Ukraine, Russia has at its disposal some very sophisticated air defence weapons, notably the S-300s, which Ukraine also has, and a more advanced S-400 system. Now, exactly how Ukraine has managed to bypass those systems remains a mystery, but we remember the head of Britain's Royal Navy praising them for their in innovations and indeed their willingness to take risk. This morning in Ukraine, news emerges that another strike by the same Storm Shadow cruise missiles, which were donated both by the UK and a similar missile donated by France, have been used to strike this building on land in the same area which should have been protected by the same sorts of missile defenses. Taken together, this shows that Russia's ships and indeed the people who command those ships can no longer be seen as safe in Sebastopol. And that will cause some very difficult questions for Russia's, for Vladimir Putin's admirals to answer as they think about where they position those vessels and those assets as they continue to prosecute the war in Ukraine. Of course, Kilo-class submarines have been particularly menacing. They can carry calibre cruise missiles, which can and have struck targets right across Ukraine. President Zelensky is in America in a bid to shore up US support for the war in Ukraine. He was there for the United Nations General Assembly, but perhaps the most important part of this visit will be the meetings he has with President Joe Biden and indeed Republican leaders uh, on Capitol Hill. Here in Ukraine, there is no doubt that American support is absolutely vital for Ukraine to have any real hope of defeating Russia and rolling Russian forces back out of Ukrainian territory. Western officials have warned that one of Vladimir Putin's main strategies is likely to try and wait out the resolve of Ukraine's NATO allies to rely on that resolve fracturing and crumbling. And we have seen in America signs, particularly from Republican lawmakers, that they are unhappy at the amount of money being given to Ukraine. So Zelensky there trying to deliver that message that he's not just fighting for Ukraine, he's fighting for the safety and freedom of Europe, and indeed that in any investment in Ukraine is an investment in Europe, indeed the world's security as well. Now closer to home, Ukraine is also having problems with its relations with neighbour Poland. The Polish Prime Minister said yesterday that Poland had stopped giving Ukraine new weapons. Pomocy humanitarnej to nic już nie się. przekazujemy z, żadnego uzbrojenia na Ukrainę z tego względu, że my teraz sami się zbroimy w najnowocześniejszą broń. Jeśli nie chcesz się bronić, to musisz się mieć czym bronić. Taką zasadę wyznajemy i dlatego dokonaliśmy zwiększonych zamówień comes on the back of a long-running dispute between these two neighbors over Ukrainian grain. You take a step back, remember that Russia has effectively blockaded Ukraine's Black Sea ports, a deal to allow Ukraine to export its grain, one of its key economic sources of income, has collapsed. That means most, if not all, of Ukraine's grain is leaving by road. 
Now, a number of countries, Poland, Slovakia and Hungary, have complained that that massive glut, unexpected influx of Ukrainian grain coming in by land has flooded their dom domestic markets, has led to a collapse in prices for them. There had been a European agreement to limit imports. That has ended. It hasn't been renewed. Poland is very unhappy. The Polish prime minister has an election coming up. So his comments should be seen in terms of his domestic audience. Nonetheless, it follows comments from Poland's president, President Duda, Andrzej Duda, who described Ukraine as like a drowning man that risks pulling in anyone who tries to help it. So we can't underestimate the seriousness of this falling out this the the fracture the tension rather the sort of friction between these two neighbors critically poland has made clear it will not stop deliveries of other western weapons transiting its soil and indeed they said that the hub at zhezhov uh, an airport close to the ukrainian border will remain open and in attempts to perhaps to soothe this row we've also heard today that specifically poland's prime minister was talking about new weapons he's saying we, poland will not send more will not send new weapons. Poland has already sent more than 300 tanks, more than 140 armored vehicles, 12 MiG-29 fighter jets, a similar number of attack helicopters. Poland reacted fast when Russia invaded. It handed over huge quantities of armor. And crucially, that was Soviet era armor that Ukraine was familiar with. It was weapons that Poland had in its arsenals, weapons that the Ukraine's armed forces were already using and knew how to use so it could fit straight into the armed forces and be thrown into the fight um, immediately. Now, Poland is in the process of rebuilding its own arsenals. Indeed, they've ordered nearly a thousand tanks from South Korea and about 600 mobile howitzers. That's a huge quantity. And what this row may also speak to is reluctance among the Poles to see that new weaponry which is planned for Poland's army also given to Ukraine. There have been whispers behind the scene that in order to maintain the tempo of donations that may be necessary. And of course, this week, we've also seen Russia restarting its ruthless campaign against Ukraine's energy infrastructure in what was described as the first attack on power stations for six months. You may remember that last winter, this became a focus of Russia's missile fury, bombardments almost every other day against power stations, substations, and transmission lines in a bid by the by in a bid by Moscow to try and freeze Ukraine out of the fight, to try and crush the will of ordinary people by freezing them into submission, denying them hot water and electricity as Ukraine went through what can be a bitterly cold winter. Now two things happened. Ukraine was lucky. It had a mild winter. There were phenomenal uh, efforts put in by the Ukrainians to try and keep the national grid functioning. And they, and they succeeded. But a According to some accounts, they succeeded by a whisker. And officials have already warned that difficult months lie ahead as Russia resorts or Russia reverts, I should say, to that tactic once more. We should expect to see more of those attacks in the coming weeks. We've had a couple of questions about the, uh, the progress of the counteroffensive. Thank you. Um, the the counter of Ukraine's counteroffensive, of course, trying to break through Russian lines in the south central region uh, to reach the Sea of Azov. Progress remains painfully slow and painfully costly. Russia's focus continues, it would seem to be, around northeastern Kupiansk. We've said that for a few weeks now. Ukraine has made some progress south of Bakhmut. Bakhmut was for many, many months the epicenter of the war, described as the meat grinder, the bloodbath battle, where uh, particularly Russia's Wagner Group mercenaries were sent, were sent in waves and waves of sort of cannon fodder assaults to their deaths. Russia did eventually capture the town, but as that happened, Ukraine captured uh, surrounding countryside and the heights outside the town. They continue, Ukraine continues uh, to fight there. But I think what we've seen is that as progress has slowed, not to a stalemate, but certainly has slowed on the battlefield inside Ukraine, it seems that the focus of both armed forces, both Russia and Ukraine, has been to strike deep behind the lines. We've seen that with the strikes on Sebastopol, both against the ship, the submarine, and today on the headquarters of Russia, Russia's naval fleet. We've seen that uh, from Russia with the strikes against Ukraine's energy infrastructure.
Uh, now, if any of you would like to continue this conversation in person, then please join me on the 28th of September at the Chelsea History Festival in central London. I'll be talking at the, Nash at the National Army Museum at 5 p.m. on the 28th of September about reporting conflict. So if any of you would like to co continue this conversation uh, about Ukraine, then by all means, uh, go to the Chelsea History Festival, 5 p.m. Thursday, the 28th, and I would love to see you there. Thank you once again for watching. We'll be joining you again next week from London.